call the meeting to order of the Deerfield Elementary School Committee for Wednesday, March 9th, 2022, <clears throat> and uh, at six o'clock. And our first order of business this evening is a public hearing to uh, review the proposed FY23 budget for the Deerfield Elementary School. Uh, this meeting is being recorded and is a virtual meeting. Um, and we will be moving into the public hearing now um, with uh, Mr. Modesto and Ms. Pereira. <laughs> so. Thanks, Ken. Sure. I'm going to share my screen and go over this budget document. Um, this looks similar to what you saw last time we reviewed this last month, but I will go over it for any public that is watching since this is our public hearing. Uh, so the budget development process is multi-step. Uh, we base it on student needs and make sure that uh, we're being fiscally responsible at the same time. So we take input from all the stakeholders involved, school leadership, administrative staff, uh, principal, um, and beyond there, data is collected as needed from other staff members with, throughout the district. So we take a hybrid approach. Uh, we look at level services, which does not necessarily mean level funding, but it means that we keep all of our existing staffing and programming in place with the first draft of the budget. And then we also consider new initiatives. Uh, new initiatives could include um, faculty or staff or new programs. Uh, and to balance those out, we look at our other expense accounts to see if there's any fluctuation up, up or down over the last several years to see if we can reallocate funds or if we're fully adding new staffing or new programs into the first draft of the budget. We also look at other budget drivers, such as special education expenses, which are generally out of our hand uh, and do fluctuate pretty significantly year to year. That could include out of district placements. It could include consultants or contractors coming in to work with students um, and transportation costs, which we are seeing a significant spike in all of those areas. And finally, we look at our revolving fund and grant funds to make sure that any existing funds that do cover expenses to help offset the general fund budget can continue to be covered in the new year. So with all of that said, uh, we presented a first draft of the budget at 5.23%. Uh, that included about $150,000 wage increase to add a new faculty position and a new IA position as well as wages for additional occupational therapy services and summer programming. We also had uh, increased a part-time nurse position in the first draft to full-time, and then added in the coverage for the nurse leader position, which is an existing position within the district previously paid from a grant that now was going to be funded by the five schools split evenly based on the cost share agreement. Um, and then we had other increases. As I said, we look at those accounts to see if they fluctuated up or down. And particularly with technology, we've been underfunded for several years, um, primarily for software related expenditures. So we did an increase to technology lines. And then we are seeing an increase in our employee separation costs based on retirements. So we were sent back to the drawing board. Uh, Tina Darius and I talked about you know, how we could bring that number down. We knew it was not going to be feasible even though we had some new requests in there. We needed to balance out a little bit more. Uh, and we brought in the second draft in February of 3.09% for a total general fund of $5,998,948. Uh, we came up with that reduction by removing the faculty position. Uh, you may remember from last month, we did have some discussion around this. And after the first draft was created, Tina went back and gathered some feedback from staff and talked to the um, majority of people in the building that she could that would be involved in that possible new position. And they decided that it was actually not going to be a priority, that they had some other things within the school that they could do to move around and meet those needs with that initial request that she thought we were going to put in for. Uh, and then we brought the OT and the nursing support request back down to part time where they are in the existing year budget. So we are presenting tonight for uh, this public hearing at 3.09%. Uh, and I know that that is up for further discussion. So I'll give you a little bit more information before we talk about that further. 
Um, and then just a side note, we're using almost another million dollars of school choice and revolving funds, as well as grant monies to fully fund the operating budget for next year. Uh, there's some historical data here. So last year, we actually went into town meeting with a 3.35% increase, which was $162,000. On town meeting floor, we reduced the budget by $50,000 due to excess funds that the school had from various savings that we didn't know we were going to have when the budget was passed. Um, so when we went into town meeting in June, we did present a $50,000 reduction, and that is what passed on town floor. So the actual increase, even though we went in at 3.35, ended up being only 2.31 last year. So that saved the town $50,000 on the elementary school budget. The prior year we had a, uh, even though we did level services and did not make any cuts, we went in with a zero dollar increase. So that meant that we moved funds around and moved expenses into different categories so that we could fully fund our existing budget by not making any cuts or reductions, but that was the first year of COVID. We had no idea what was gonna happen with chapter 70 and needed to cut things back a bit. And then you can see the prior two years before that, we have been under 3%. Uh, enrollment data we have looked at previously, but just to give you those numbers there. Uh, so this is based on the October 21 enrollment, which is what DESE uses for the prior or for the next year. We are up significantly. Our choice numbers are up. Um, more than our resident numbers are up, but overall the school is seeing an increase and in, in a growth, bringing us back up to the 2019 number, which was significantly higher, still significantly higher than where we are, but we're, we're moving in the right direction. And then I did want to give you a revolving fund projection, just so you have that info, since I did say we'd be using almost another million dollars to fund expenditures from revolving funds. So early childhood has a significant balance going into next year because in the current year, all of our expenditures were paid from the ESSER grant. We made that decision last year as part of the budget process to save up and build our reserves since we had used all of the money pretty much the year before to continue to pay staff, even though we did not have revenue coming in and school was remote. Um, so essentially, we're going money in, money out. We're going to use that money in the next fiscal year for FY23. We are overspending, but we'll still have a balance of about 32000 as projected at the end of next year. This is actually a little bit lower than I'd like it to be for Deerfield. I'd like us to look moving forward of how we start to move some things off of early childhood and uh, have the program essentially fund one year and keep maybe closer to fifty or 70000 because if we have one student come into the program that's significantly high needs, and even if we have to hire one IA, that $30,000 is almost going to be completely eaten up in one position if that is needed based on an IEP or other needs in the classroom. So I'd like to build that back up in the future, but it's still a decent balance um, considering that we had almost depleted. Uh, so school lunch and special education, school lunch is the same scenario. We pay, We are paying for um, salaries primarily from the ESSER fund to build back up for this year. Uh, school lunch is a little bit um, unknown right now still because we don't know if the USDA is going to approve free lunches for all students moving forward or if we're going to go back to students paying. So that could change these projections, um, which would mean that, you know, we might have to think about creatively how we fund because we are overexpending again what we're bringing in and uh, still gonna have a, a healthy balance. You know, we can't carry too much money in the school lunch account. That's actually frowned upon when we have our USDA audits if our account balance is too high. So 40 to 50,000 is a good amount for us to stick to. So that'll be our goal moving forward. Um, special education, the current year, we did not fund any salaries out of that fund because we did not anticipate having any revenue come in when we had this conversation last year. Uh, that changed and we do have a student coming tuition in in the current year who's out of district coming into us paying tuition So we're able to build up our fund balance that student is expected to return So we would have another year of revenue coming in uh, And then we'd be around 50,000 and I think that that could be this might be the last year that right now We have that student tuition and there may be two more years. I can't remember if the child is in um, fifth or sixth grade. So, you know, we'll have to talk about that fund again in the future, whether or not we have anyone coming in and how we handle the salaries and wages there. 
And then finally, our school choice account. So we have been building this up over the last few years, although you can also see we've been overspending. So a couple of years back, we had a budget freeze. We reallocated some money around uh, and we put some extra in school choice so that we could overspend. That helped us do that zero dollar increase two years ago. Uh, so slowly, I think we have to work on bringing this down because we do not want to bring our reserves too far. We also have to be mindful that school choice is one of those fluctuating uh, revenue sources for us. If our school choice numbers drop or if we can't take more students because classrooms are at capacity, it limits our revenue coming in. So um, this is down from the current year at 483. I think in 22, we're spending um, 525 or somewhere around there. So we are working to bring expenditures off of it, but you know we got to continue to work on that in the future. But still, a really healthy balance at 876,000 projected for um, the following end of next year. And and I just want to make a note with that account that you know this is really the school's um, backfall. You know the school itself doesn't have quote unquote free cash. Uh, like the town does or like the regional school does. So if there is a major building repair that has to happen unexpectedly, for instance, I'll give an example of the boiler going down because we've had that happen in Sunderland and Frontier. This year we're working on replacing boilers in both of those schools. This fund allows us to cover those significant expenditures, which is why we keep our balance the way that it is. Or we could have one or two students go out of business suddenly and we're looking at um, hundred thousand dollar increase in our out of district placement. So, um, just so the public knows that that's why we carry such a significant balance in there, because uh, it is quite a bit of money. But it's really our our saving grace if we have any issues. So I know it's a lot of information in a short amount of time. Um, I'll stop presenting and then uh, take questions, or or we can talk further about what that three point. 09 looks like we are looking to have school committee vote and approve this budget to move forward for town presentation. Uh, I think I don't know when Deerfield is if it's next month or not, um, but that's later on the agenda. Mm -hmm. So, okay, thank you, Shelley. Mm -hmm. um, I know that we have someone in the audience watching uh, who has sent a memo to folks. Um, Julie Chalfant, if I mispronounced that, Julie, my apologies. Um, and I didn't know if you wanted to, uh, or if we wanted to invite her in just to, to make a couple of comments so that the public, the general public would be aware of the um, issues that the town is facing or, or not. Are you there, Julie? I am, yes. Um, Welcome. So I did send a memo. The, um, the This is shaping up to be a very challenging budget year for the town. We've had a number of um, groups come in with budgets that are much higher than we had hoped. Um, a couple specific examples, the Franklin Tech um, has gone way up because the number of students has increased dramatically there. I don't know, maybe... I should have the number in front of me, but I don't. But it went from something like 19 to 29. Um, so that um, that budget request has gone way up. Um, the other very significant one was the South County EMS. Um, they had much reduced revenues uh, essentially a year ago because of COVID, because apparently nobody was calling the ambulance at that point, I guess going to the hospital. But, um, but it, regardless, they, they had a year of very reduced revenues, so they don't have the reserves that they normally have so that they've had to go back and ask for more from the towns. Um, so they are a, a very significant increase. And then there's a whole rash of other ones that, of, of folks asking. We are going back through all of these budgets now and then going back to all of these people and asking um, you know, if there's a way that they could trim them down. But um, when I was at your meeting last month it looked like there was an option that you had that would come in at about two and a half percent um and if there's any way you can get to that two and a half percent number that would really help the town out and if i'm not mistaken shelly what is it forty nine thousand or so is one percent on the budget is that correct 
just right. <laughs> We so would be looking at a reduction of about thirty thousand to get us around two and a half percent. Yeah, about twenty-five to thirty thousand is what I had figured. So okay, yeah. just uh, wanted to um, to just to touch base again on on the concerns that were sent to to us. Um, and uh, thank you, Julie, for that those words. <clears throat> Does anyone have any questions for Shelley? Actually, I have a question. It's not necessary. It's more based on something Julie just said. So maybe it goes to Darius and it's not really our school, but on that Franklin tech issue, um, is that, is that a projection for kids who are starting next fall or is it because this year there's such an increase that it sort of hits the books already? Like, like where, how does that go in terms of fiscal years and, and added kids in the school in terms of the assessment for the town? It's the increase of last year's numbers because they wouldn't have their acceptance rate yet. Okay, so so they're predicting. No, I think they're, those are they're running. I think they run off of last year's numbers. So that's what's in ninety-five percent sure that they run off the enrollment for last year's and now we're creating the next year's budget. Okay, so so in, in other words, that's not necessarily an increase. It's just a continuation of an increase that we've already hit. In this no, I think they take their rolling average off of the previous year. Right. Or, or, the, or the current year, sorry, when they're developing their budget. So they look right. at the current year. And shall I jump in if you know it absolutely certain? But I believe they use their current year. So they're using their FY21, 22 school year population, just like we showed our October 1 report. And they build off the building of the towns from that. And so we don't, we could, that number could go up even further next year if you have more details <laughs> going to tech. Now understand that the population in Franklin County has gone down, but tech has not decreased the number of students it takes. Just a side politics question. Go. Well, it's also uh, become more popular, I think, too, for probably a good reason. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So they looked at, they, they probably they looked at this year's numbers where they got them from and then they assess the town the following year okay so i guess one other point there is their overall increased request to all the towns was under two percent but it just the way it falls out with the number of students deerfield has that ours ours went up quite a bit basically our percentage went up this year versus what they asked for last year <clears throat> okay. And did we get, so Julie may also know, I know that the tech, um, their E&D was in excess of the 5%. Is that money coming back to town at all helpful for that increasing cost? Um, I don't have the, I can, I have it here, but I need to open it up. Um, but they did, I, I do know that they used it because their overall, like their total budget went up six-ish percent. But the budget, the the amount, the request, the total request from the towns was under two percent. So they've used other funds to supplement their their total budget. So they don't actually have to give it back, like in the form of we pay you back. They have to use it towards their next assessment. So that could be how they got under the two percent increase. Because if you're over in the one year, whatever you're over that five percent, you've got to put it back through your assessment. So that could be how they're doing it. Okay. <clears throat> um, do any folks have any other questions? Eric has your hand up. Oh, Erica does. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, Erica. Um, yeah, I was just, uh, and this may be a procedural thing of um, when, if we have to, you know, if we have a 3%, but a budget with a 3% increase now and we, are, you know, as, as Julie's asking us to look at it, reducing it by the 30 or 40,000, where, when, either, do we, can we talk about it now as to what would be the proposed things to, to reduce, or do we, um, or does that happen later, or, you know, do we have an idea of, yeah, when, when, when we would discuss that, and I'm just wondering what, what that kind of 
um, would look like? Sure. The, um, the, the way the meeting goes right now is we're in a public hearing. We will close the public hearing uh, when we've taken as many questions as there might be out there. Um, and once that takes place and we've closed, then we will go into um, our full conversation on the budget and, and the strategy or, or the intent of the committee and we would proceed towards a vote. The, the goal is tonight is to take a vote on a budget number that we will send along to the Finance Committee and board and Select Board uh, for their consideration. Um, so it will take place this evening. It will take place in a, in a general conversation amongst the committee, uh, assuming you know we've uh, gotten as much input from the public hearing as we can. And this is different for me because I think this is the first pu public hearing that I've done. I'm sure we did it last year remotely, but we didn't, uh, we weren't as um, savvy back then with our remote meetings. Um, but this is really the first time I've, I've done a public hearing and not, not been in a, <laughs> a public space with, with people sitting in the audience that could ask questions. So um, anyways, Thank that's you. that's basically the answer that I hope you're looking for. We will we will be deciding on a budget number this evening. Um, yes, that's, that's what I was asking. Proposed or less, I don't think we'll be increasing it. <laughs> so, <clears throat> any other questions out there? I I um I would welcome any questions from the general public that's in attendance here if they. If anyone has any questions uh, before we close our hearing. And uh, since I'm not seeing any hands getting raised, I think we can move towards a closing of the public hearing on the um, two uh, FY23 budget for the Deerfield Elementary Schools. Um, so we will officially close the hearing at 6.23 p.m. And we will move on with the rest of our agenda. <clears throat> we will be getting back to the budget, but uh, first we have a couple of business issues, uh, business matters to clean up. Um, and uh, we'll go from there. So the next item on the agenda is to review and approve the minutes of February 3rd, 2022. Do I have a motion? No, motion to approve. Second. And carry second. Um, I had a couple notes that I noticed. Um, so I can get my darn get my cursor to cooperate so that I can get to my notes. Um, I noticed that the motion um, the motion for <clears throat> approval of the MOA with Gripco, uh, the motion by Ken Cutterback seconded by Kerry Etchells to the MOA with uh, Gripco. <laughs> I think we need a little bit more language there. So I would suggest that we say motion uh, by Ken, seconded by Carrie, to approve a mem memorandum of agreement with grid code transportation as recommended. <clears throat> and the second item I noticed was that under the summary of documents presented, there's no mention of the memorandum of agreement. Darius, is that something that would normally be included in the document list? Yes. So that would be the two things that I noticed. And Kerry, nice job on the minutes. <clears throat> uh, thank you. And do you need a second for those changes? Or I generally just, I, we have a motion to approve the minutes 
And I would just say that that motion that David made was in anticipation of amendment. So it was a motion to approve <laughs> minutes as amended. So we're already there. Um, I do have one other, sorry. If, sure. If I, may. Um, I know I just noticed my, <laughs> it's a small thing. My name is spelled wrong in the adjournment. Um, Jacob does not have an S at the end. But that's okay. Very minor. Eric, I apologize. I did check for your name spelling. <laughs> I know you know who it's <laughs> not a problem. Oh, look at that. I missed that one. Sorry about that. <clears throat> so, um, so we have the three amendments. or edits or corrections, whatever. Um, so any further discussion? Hearing that, none, all those in favor? We will do a roll call vote. Ken Cutterback, yes. David Sharp? Yes. Gary Etchels? Yes. Erica Jacob? Yes. Mary Raymond? Yes. It is unanimous. Um, financial statement and signing of warrants. And I think so I Shelley, emailed you, hi, yes. Oh, go ahead. Um, I emailed you the expense reports. I'm happy to take questions about them, but I did not send um, a formal update. There's no new concerns regarding the budget. Uh, the one change with this report is that you will see that salaries um, have now been entered onto this report. They were previously in a zeros and we've got that in the system. Mm -hmm. uh, we're still mm -hmm. working out some glitches with this and, and you'll see that there are some negatives on some of the salary accounts, meaning that we're overspent. Um, and that's in part because we're still getting the various funding sources in. So if somebody's split between multiple funds, they're all hitting general fund right now. So this is still not 100% perfect, but you know, we're in, in process and I, I don't expect any um, concerns. We do have some savings that I think we're gonna realize by the end of the year due to uh, positions that haven't been filled yet or changes in staffing that, you know, had a delay in refilling the position. So I actually think we're gonna see some savings at the end of the year. Um, but I can take questions if anyone has a specific line item question. And then the only other thing that I'll note is the 18 warrants were signed electronically. The total on that was $168,297.56. Great. Um, I had a couple questions if no one else does, and you may have just answered them <laughs> with your salary explanation. Um, as I was going through, I did notice a negative under instructional assistance. So I, I won't ask about that at this point in time. I'll wait for another year, another month or two for it to clear up. Substitutes. Um, nothing has been logged yet against the substitute line item. And I'm just curious if that's um, intentional or is it part of the salary issue? So we've definitely had some subs in. Um, I think Tina could talk to that. What I think happens with this line is because our substitutes are not all in the database yet, a manual journal entry has to be done to book that transaction, and that has not been done yet. Okay. Um, I figured there was an easy explanation somewhere. The nurse line, I think, is a true overage because when we built the budget last year, um, we had to absorb part of the nurse leader position off of right. the grant. And so that hit after the budget was approved. So that is an actual overage uh, mm -hmm. if you look at that line. But the rest of the salaries, they're really, you know, once this is more cleaned up, <laughs> Um, you won't see those overages. You're actually going to see some okay. savings. The librarian, I believe, is also a um, actual overage, but there's going to be, it, it's just a matter of moving accounts. When we combine the library position with a media position that we had, there'll be savings in the classroom. I basically just swapped categories. And when we report to Desi, we have to report the right function code. So, you know, that's really just a um, bookkeeping 
math there. We don't have an extra 72,000 that we're short on the budget. It's just a math piece, um, an accounting piece. Okay. <clears throat> Somewhere in here I had other questions, just a sec. Yeah. I was organized, but um, only partially. The next questions I had are sort of looking at, um, and it, it's just, they're, they're aimed at trying to help me piece together the, um, the FY23 budget. So that's why I had these um, questions asked. Um, under the choice, um, monthly expenditure report, uh, we have 249,000 of the instructional assistance salaries covered by school choice. I just want to confirm that that is, I mean, that's what the numbers are saying to me. Yep, let me just pull up the right report and verify that that is accurate. Two forty nine. I actually have a placeholder in my budget workbook for two seventy four, but we may be down in IA right now, or I may have shifted a funding source for the current year. Mm -hmm. um, for FY twenty three, we are still going to definitely be paying IAs. Right. Um, and I can tell you what that number is as a placeholder. Well, I mean, they've historically been one of the biggest expenditures out of school choice funds. So that's yep. that's how we um, have been able to support our, our IA uh, population. Um, so you don't need to dig too deeply. The, um, okay. tr the transportation budget shows 50,000. Um, yep. That is uh, the 50000 that we reduced on town meeting floor last year. So because okay. we had budget savings, we reallocated yep. to choice and plan to spend that out of choice this year. That actually, um, we are going to pay some transportation in FY23 out of um, school choice, but it's going to be for special education. That 50000 that you see right now is regular transportation. Correct. Yeah. Okay. And um, and we are carrying one hundred and twenty thousand for the out of district tuitions, <clears throat> which is over um, budget in the current year. Next year, right. based on Karen's projections, um, we're increasing it by five thousand up to one twenty five for next year. Okay, I think that was all I had. <laughs> so those are all good questions. Well, it just it hopefully ties in when we get around to the uh, the next discussion. So, any other questions from anyone else? Could I just ask a generic question, um, Shelley? Yeah. Um, when you talk about um, savings that we're going to see or have or accrue from this last year, is it general um, description you can give of how that works and where that money goes? So historically... Do we, lose it? do we lose Do we lose it from the school or the different pots of money? Are we losing some savings back into a general fund or are we able to uh, carry some quote-unquote savings that you're going to, you know, that we're going to uh, realize over to the next year? So historically, what we've done is if we have savings, which generally comes from salaries and wages, whether it's a leave, unpaid leave of absence, a vacancy, um, a delay in refilling a position, whatever it is, we generally will take that, move something. I want to make try to not complicate this. Something that I would normally pay on school choice in the current year that's budgeted to be paid from choice. If we have general fund extra quote unquote money, I will move something off of choice to decrease our choice expenses to use up the general fund. And then we can use that extra choice money in the next year, which is exactly what we did with the transportation in the current year. 
We had 50,000 savings in general fund. So we moved things around to save that choice money to help bring our budget down um, as a one-time expenditure. Okay. Does Thanks. that make sense? Perfect sense. Okay, good. <laughs> Great. Um, so no other questions. We can move on to the principal's report. I just have a few things. I did send it out ahead of time. So hoping you got a chance to look at it. Um, we offer some professional development this week. So shout out to Sue Baraski, who used a webinar facilitated by Heather Forbes, who's an expert in the field of trauma, to bring the language of trauma training session to IAs. Um, and some general information, we're getting a new convection oven. So that's exciting for the kitchen staff. Um, you know, Jeffrey McDonald, our food, food service director, was able to um, receive a grant. So that's fully paid for by grant. That's even Jeffrey. more exciting. <laughs> yeah, that's great. <right. laughs> we just dropped the budget by 50% uh, percent over there. Just kidding. Um, and then uh, this during vacation, the heating system, we had some maintenance happen with our heating system. Our pre-K and K hall um, wings were running a little cold, so they they came in and pressure washed our radiators, and we are now warm. Thank you for our snow day to prove that to us. Um, in some classroom news, preschool um, has completed a unit on nocturnal animals and Arctic animals. Uh, kindergarten kicked off their maple syrup sugaring um, study last week. They're tapping trees. Teachers are boiling up the sap and then a pancake feast. So that's pretty exciting. Mrs. Graves classroom finished their animal research project where they create these guess what I am books, plastic poems and facts. It's one of the favorites for second graders. Um, in our five, uh, fifth grade classroom, Ms. Brown's classroom, they recently finished some nonfiction units of study and readers workshop and in writing workshop. Um, our library just celebrated Read Across America. We had a guest reader, Dr. Bill, with um, sixth graders. This was added to the agenda after, so if you want to go take a peek, there's a few pictures in there. Um, and so that's pretty much what's kind of happening around our school. That's Great. the short and sweet version. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the, uh, the report was was it was an easy read this month so it was nice any anticipation from the um the school community on the 14th and the um mask mask option issue Wait, uh as in general as our community as a whole yes just yeah, yeah i think we're prepared to um you know, honor everybody's comfort level as far as mask wearing or not. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, we haven't, it seems to be going smoothly so far. <laughs> well, great. We'll see what Monday brings. <laughs> I'm confident it's going to go um, go off without a hitch. I don't know if you remember, but we removed the mask mandate during recess time, which, you know, we weren't sure how that was going to work out, but students and, and families made decisions to wear masks for their, or, or have their children wear masks during that time. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I anticipate it going pretty similarly. Okay, well, good. I just thought I would ask and um, yeah. let you know that thoughts are with you <laughs> in the schools. Um, so uh, principal's report. Uh, the next item is public comment. I had no notification that uh, we had anyone to uh, speak during the public comment session, sec session. Uh, so there is no public comment this evening. Unfinished business, COVID-19 update. Anything from Darius on that or? Uh, nothing, uh, I guess small little news is that we did have two weeks worth of um, uh, pool testing since we've returned and we've had, we were we had one positive pool in the entire, one positive case in the entire district the first week. We had a couple pools positive and they ended up shaking out as not all being positive. And then we had none this week. So the numbers really have dropped as was being predicted. Um, it's still out there in the community, but we're just not seeing it in the school right now, which is great. Yeah. 
Well, that's good to hear. Um, capital improvement plan update. I have no capital news to report. I've been managing to miss all the capital improvement plan getting quorums. So uh, we're scheduled to meet next week and I'll have a better feel for things then. Uh, I'm pleased to hear that the grant was successful. Congratulations to our food services director and successfully obtaining a grant. I know you've got other equipment that's uh, surfacing at Frontier. Um, so it's nice to at least have have the grant come through and help us up, update our, our ovens. So congratulations. Can I have a quick question about that? Sure. Um, just my memory, not very good anymore, but I thought that earlier this year we'd had a discussion about um, ovens, uh, some big stuff in the elementary school cafeteria, and we did we take some kind of vote to put some money into something, and does this grant save that, or am I thinking about something different? No, I think your your memory is serving you mostly correctly. I'd have to go back and look at my notes or minutes from the meeting in question, but when the issue was brought up, we talked about how we could support it if it came to that, but I, I don't think we took a formal vote authorizing the money. We authorized them to proceed and we would react based on the grant application is I think the way we were approaching it. But so in other words, my memory is my memory is equally spotty. So. so it was softening softening us up and because there was an expense potentially coming if we didn't get the grant. That's what I think we did, yes. Okay. Yeah, I can elaborate a little bit further on that. So we did talk about it, I think, in early January, um, and we were talking about possibly needing twenty five or thirty thousand dollars because there are multiple things going on in the cafeteria and kitchen that are not functioning to the level that they should be. Um, so this grant just covered about nine thousand dollars, which almost pays for the convection oven, which is amazing. And then uh, Jeff and I, Jeff is our new food service director, we're in conversation about how we can fund some other things uh, without having to ask for more town capital or dip into school choice or eat too much of the reserves of the school lunch fund. Um, Deerfield Elementary did receive a rural school aid grant this year, which it has not received in the past. Um, Typically, these types of grants that come in that we aren't expecting, we didn't even apply for this. The state just awards it based on um, population and, and the area, and typically only Sunderland gets it, but all four of the elementary schools received it this year. So um, we don't have a spending plan for that money yet. So Sarah Mitchell and I have talked um, in lieu of Kim not being here because normally Kim would be a big part of those conversations for curriculum and stipends and you know other things that we spend um, grants on. But we are talking about using a good chunk of that money, which I think is around twenty thousand uh, dollars for some of the kitchen equipment, because it really is a priority that we start to take care of some of that stuff. And some of it's also small, like getting new bowls or new cutlery, you know, things like that, um, and then working on some of that bigger equipment also. Okay. I hope we have a, a more concrete update for you next month as well. Okay. So we're now back to, it says new business, but I think it's actually old business or it's our third month talking about it, but the uh, FY23 proposed budget. Uh, I'm curious what people are thinking and uh, how people are inclined to want to proceed with the uh, FY23 budget. So the version that was proposed that was closer to 2.5%, uh, if I recall correctly, that was Dropping one of the grades from three sections to two, I think it was most of the savings on that one. So I guess I'd, I'd want to know, um, Tina, what, what are the thoughts on that? How is that something, how does that affect the school? Well, so if we looked in dropping the, go ahead, is, did somebody else talk? Well, I was just going to say, maybe just to be more efficient, I mean, um, is there even any appetite to... Um, and I'm, Carrie, I'm not interrupting you at all, but I mean, is there any appetite to even consider 
um, a change to the budget that's been presented to us by the administration tonight. And I guess one the reason I'm putting that forward is um, <clears throat> remember we are never going to get the finance committee coming to this committee and asking us to uh, have a budget that's more than two and a half percent of an increase. Right. So um, while we certainly get better, I think information and communication now with the uh, finance committee, you know, I think it, um, there's nothing unusual that I've heard that's any different from other years. And the way this, the town and the way we do our budgets, we're all sort of at a disadvantage because we don't, you know, we don't have a calendar here. We don't know, you know, which other, um, you know, parts of the town have come forward and, you know, already had a session um, where the budgets, you know, are fixed or submitted or not. So obviously we have a lot of, of issues here. Um, but 3.09, if you look at our um, trends over the last few years, I think, you know, we've, we've pushed pretty hard when we've been asked during difficult times. I mean, three years ago, we were under two and a half. I suppose the can't really crow about the zero because I think a lot of like, I think everybody was probably level funded in that year because um, it was such a, an odd year. Um, but I guess I'm just throwing it out there that I don't know that um, the where we're at now that we really have that knowledge that we should be the ones, the first ones taking the taking taking a move to to make a cut. And especially no, no, it's, you know, dropping a class um, as the way to do that. I appreciate that point, David. Um, that's kind of what I was uh, I'm looking. I'm not seeing a lot of fluff in the budget. I'm not. I'm wondering if we were going to decrease, how we would do that. So that's a that's a good point you're raising. Yeah, I would just sort of go along with that idea of of it'd be great to know if if there are any only just for the sake of, of knowing what we're up against, like if there is anything that's possible to, you know, cut, but, but again, it does seem like we, um, we already did go through a set of reductions or at least there was the look, the, the analysis of what could be cut and it was already, it's like we've already reduced it. Um, you know, maybe not we as a school committee, but but Shelley and, and Tina and their discussions about the different positions that they put in there. So I suppose I'm just you know adding to that uh, agreement with both of you that that perhaps we don't have a whole lot of wiggle room. Um, though of course, if you know if, if there was something we could do, we certainly look to look at it. Um. I, you know, Ken, I think David, David brings up the point that I always have that I, I agree with you, David, completely, that I don't see the, and Julia, I hope you're still listening, you know, we don't see the full picture. So Frontier, I only know what Frontier, what the schools are doing. And Frontier is very low for Deerfield as well. So it's a really, you know, overall really low year for schools. And this is, is this an anomaly year for the town regarding the other needs? And that becomes that kind of the balancing act of, you know, where do we firm up versus, you know, what's the police asks? I don't know what their asks are this year. What is the fire ask? You know, and then balancing all that because that's where you don't have, um, you know, the consistent coordination of all the different budgets coming together. So we kind of are in a, you know, we reduce, you know, of course, you know, we reduce our budget and then we become tighter and then we have to go larger next year. You know, then we end up getting a four or five percent next year because we have to drop a balance or whatever the story is. Uh, you know, it's hard. It's hard doing two and a half when there's no way our our even our our, our main lines are going to increase by over two and a half next year. Um, <clears throat> so I don't know. I, I so I agree with that. I don't know how we improve that because when is there emergency? When is it not? You know that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um so the budget requests we have so far, I'm sorry, I'm not part of the committee. Do you mind if I <laughs> No, don't mind. <laughs> okay. Um, so we don't have, we do not have the police budget yet, and we do not have the highway department yet. They're both unions going through contract negotiations, and, and we, don't, we just don't have the salary numbers for either of them. 
So if we put level funded, like the same dollar value as last year, this year in, and go through all the requests we have so far, we have $55,000 left with no capital at all. Um, so it, it is, I mean, the, the everybody is asking for more. Um, and so we're going back to everybody and saying, please, can you look at this again and go back? The other problem that we have that, I mean, you guys know this more than anybody is that the schools are such a huge percentage of the town budget that if the school goes up a half a percent, it's a, a disproportionate impact on the rest of it. And the, so the, the, the Franklin Tech one is really the very challenging thing. That went up 67%. Wow. Right. It's Two hundred and something thousand dollars that the increase. And again, it's not when I looked at it, I just went back and checked. It was like one point two, three percent increase total. It's just that our numbers went up so high that that our um, it, it's a little alarming. And so I've, I've already gone back to um, South County EMS and asked them to take a turn on it. Um, we are going to next week. We should have all of the budget in except for the, the police and the highway. And, and we're going to do the, the sit down and go through it and figure out where we can push back. Um, there's a number, a lot of people, there have been a number of requests for increased personnel in within the town departments. And we'll be looking at all of those requests as well. Um, like you said, we don't, it, I, I would be a lot happier if we like had all the budgets on day one and we could look at the total amount of money and then compare, but we don't. So we piecemeal through it and we're just getting to the point, you know, maybe next week we'll have almost the whole thing together and be able to go back. But it, it's looking mm -hmm. to me that it, you know, than the previous few years. Strangely enough, Julie, what the COVID business we had to deal with a couple years ago. Hey, Julie, when was the last time a town did an override? <laughs> well, and so, and the reason why I say that coming up here because you do have to do an override every few, not only every few years, but every number of years in order to make a correct and adjustment because a two and a half percent actual growth isn't, isn't realistic. And what yeah. happens in my kind of history of watching us in neighboring communities, schools are usually the ones that end up pushing that because we have the largest mm -hmm. number of budget. So we wait till the school has the worst year and then go into an app over it. And you can hear where I'm going to lean there, and I know you're not going to go that route, but I just want to be like, the, the conversation has to come up at two and a half over it isn't a bad thing, it's a correction thing. That we this is going to have to eventually happen. I hope that you make that as part of your conversations that people are talking that way that eventually in the next three years, Deerfield's going to need a two and a half override to adjust all their budgets instead of robbing Peter to pay Paul constantly until there's nothing left. So yeah. yeah. So the subject has definitely come up. Um, my personal opinion is that next week, next year would be a better year than this year because of the impact of inflation. And I think if inflation goes up wicked bad, and we've done an override this year, then next year we're we're really going to have a problem. But that's just my opinion. We haven't gone into it in depth. Well, I think in in my my memory of the past, the only overrides I'm aware of in the town have been involved with um, capital projects. Yeah, we've had a number of those. Yeah, I cannot think of I can think of one year when we talked about it. Maybe Mary remembers something differently, but um, we've never had a um, proposition two and a half override vote based on budgets uh, in in my memory in the 35 to 40 years that I've been attending town meetings and, and following things a little bit. So um, my my concern, Julie, with um, with taking even real even recognizing it's, you know, 30 or forty thousand um, dollars is that we've been able over the past couple of years to utilize as as all municipalities and everybody has uh, funds associated with the COVID response in um, working through our budgets and, and making operations work and I'm really uh, and I'm also concerned with inflation for next year as you just mentioned I, I noticed we have electricity and heat 
flat but you know flat line budget versus this year and if the uh, energy markets continue the way they are that's not going to be a realistic number for us to hit uh, it's going to be it will make things very interesting next year for heat and electricity um so while i i I would love to try and get to two and a half percent. I think the 3.0 is good. We can, um, hearing none, we'll proceed to a roll call vote. Ken Cutterback, yes. Carrie Etchells? Yes. David Sharp? Yes. Erica Jacob? Yes. And Mary Raymond? Yes. It is unanimous, five to nothing. Julie will have that sent along to Casey and the and the, the rest of you, and we'll continue to talk. All right, thanks. Thank you for taking the time to, to um, speak with us this evening and, and attend the meeting. So we appreciate it. And I appreciate thanks, Julie. the god awful hours that you've got ahead of you. <laughs> so thank you for your service. <clears throat> so. The next on, item on the agenda would be an April joint school committee meeting discussion. Okay. It's more like an announcement. I guess I could have rolled that into a superintendent's report, but the uh, just remind everybody we have a joint meeting in April. Um, I am going to attempt to do a hybrid model meeting where we can be in person or be remote at the same time. Um, and um, we will on that meeting. We'll it's kind of like it's the big planning for next year. Um, we'll present the calendar the professional development. We'll have a report from Romney Associates regarding our anti-racism and equity work. Um, so a lot of, it's a, it's a big, it's a heavy meeting. It's one of those long ones where you got a lot of the stuff that we haven't been um, talking about, all the stuff that's happening behind the scenes being brought forward to be shared with the full committee. Um, so just putting that on everybody's radar. If you have anything you want to discuss at that full meeting, um, just kind of reminding people that some of the stuff that we're gonna have to do as a single thing is being put off to May. Mm -hmm. so Shelly and I have that um, list growing. <clears throat> um, sort of piggybacking off of that, uh, you mentioned that it, you're, you're pointing towards trying to have it be a hybrid meeting. I guess my question to this committee is um, now that our mask masking decision has been made for the schools and the schools are going to be opening up a little bit um, in that respect, does this committee want to consider either a hybrid or an in-person meeting for our next standalone school committee meeting? Did, did the governor or whoever rescind that whole open meeting law that made it so confusing technically? To, <laughs> I mean, I'm sure we'd all be happy to be in person except for the technical problems that you guys have to go through to make it happen. Right. No. Yeah, cool. The one thing that also is very different where, you know, I know there was, I heard some rumors amongst people like, well, you know, what about this nice meeting? You know, you just voted, to, you know, for a mask to come off. Well, if we were in person, we'd all have to wear masks. The mask mandate is still in effect until Monday. So we'd all right. be wearing masks in front of a TV screen. Um, so, but, you know, so that's one of the big things is that anytime we had a meeting, we'd be masked in a room where this is actually I'm not against, you know, I actually like virtual meetings. I think we communicate just fine. Um, yeah. You know, I think it's, it's, in some cases, I look at the way Shelly has access to all of her files and all her, and two computer screens and able to do a lot more um, to answer questions than pecking on a laptop. But that all being said, um, there's that kind of, you know, intrinsic push to, to, to go back to it. Um, right now, um, you know, we did, I did a capital meeting um, in person for Frontier and we did a, uh, we had a few people that were joining us remotely, and I have this large screen, basically a large screen TV, where there where a large screen computer is what it really is, and they're on the screen, we're there, and we have a microphone in the middle of us. Um, it might be a bit zooish with our with the the, the full committee, um, so I know I'm taking on a lot at once, um, but it, it's a. Uh, Technically, each individual committee could meet at their own individual spots and come together on the same meet. Uh, I don't even want to. Oh, that could be a headache. But yeah. anyway, so I'm just trying to, like, I know there was some talk, like, oh, why the school committee, you know, they're making kids go back, well, well, but they're not meeting in person themselves, you know, that kind of thing. And so I'm trying to meet. Um, well, I shouldn't be meeting that, but. That's sort of the, 
the question to me is the optics. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's been wonderful to be able to attend meetings and I can attend a lot more meetings, especially when I'm traveling by being able to participate remotely. Um, no one needs to know that I'm in Hilton Head, South Carolina or somewhere else during the course of the meeting, you know, or, or something like that. But um, at the same time, just the fact that, you know, you could be in a room with the public, um, it would make, certainly make public discourse a little more uh, manage, manageable in some ways in that people won't be as inclined to say or do some of the things that they tend to do in a Zoom type meeting. Um, if it's all everyone's face to face sitting in the same room. So I, I don't know. It's, I, I just wanted to ask. I think I went off. I started rambling on. I never answered what David's question was. They extended it to July. Okay. So all right. I have to, there has to be a virtual component until July, which makes no sense based on the other movements by the government, but that's what they're doing. Okay. And when is our, sorry, when is our next meeting, the one you're talking, you're asking about, Ken? Uh, when, when would the next meeting that we're debating, whether it's going to be in person or virtual? That would be the May meeting. Okay. The April meeting is a joint meeting, correct? That's correct. And that'll okay. be the fifth. The joint meetings on the fifth of April, um, and I expect it probably to be a hybrid model, um, mm -hmm. based on both reasons, both on um, people be able to get here and um, be able to get here. So, okay, uh, I just My thought I would ask. Go ahead. I, I just want to say, um, I, I personally, I'd be happy to resume meeting in person as of May. Um, but with needing the high needing remote access, um, can we wait and see how hybrid goes in April and sure. see how if it's still it's frustrating to work with sometimes with on both sides, um, people in person and people at home. Mm -hmm. So if we have to keep remote option and hybrid's difficult, I would be inclined to stay remote through the rest of the year. Okay. But if it works, I'd be open to in person. All right. I just I mean, thought I'd Go ahead, Erica. I was just going to also say that I, I would be fine with in person. Um, I mean, I would want to kind of keep track on how COVID is doing and whether, you know, I would be thinking that we'd still be social distancing to some extent. And so setting oh, up sure. things that way. Okay. That, yeah, that would be my only other concern, really. But I yes. most likely would still be wearing a mask. So <laughs> <laughs> it'd be one of the oddballs. But, uh, Okay, uh, I just thought I would ask as we were Thank you. Um, meeting the end of that topic. So uh, we're down to reports. Uh, the committee chair doesn't have any anything to report. Um, superintendent's report? Nope, no report. No report. Can okay. I ask the superintendent a question? <laughs> <laughs> it's not actually, it's not really a question so i could have brought it up earlier it's a sort of general district-wide thing so um it won't be too long but i was just struck and i know that you know if the newspapers get a half right they're doing okay but i was struck by a comment that shelley had in the paper dealing with the frontier budget and it sounded like you were expressing some stuff about uh, the declining enrollment as being a, an issue over there and a sort of bigger issue maybe there um and I just wondered, we, it's this funny business, obviously, with public schools, advertising, and you don't want to be competing or anything like that. But it seemed to me that something came across my desk, a, a DESE study in the, sometime in the last few months, which was talking about um, the high schools in the state. And it basically had all these statistics about how many of the kids went to four-year colleges. Um, and... If you looked at our district, it's my memory is that we send a higher percentage of kids to four-year colleges than any other school district in the Valley, except I think Long Meadow. Like it was, you know, more than Amherst, more than right. Northampton, more than obviously, uh, you know, the ones around here. And I just, you know, I know we don't advertise, but is there any, you know, sort of um, 
in anything we do as a district, sort of communicate out to parents or communicate to the at large, or not that we want to need a slogan, but is it just something that if that is true, is there some kind of not a mantra, but is there some kind of just, you know, message that can get out a little bit about that, if that's true, just that idea that, you know, uh, and again, I know that, and I'm, it's a very broad thing for your colleges, I'm not big into sort of certain measurements, but that seems to be a very standard measurement about a school uh, that is succeeding and is a general measurement that many parents would, um, you know, think of as a positive message and it's almost something that starts in the elementary schools you know as a sort of groundswell into frontier mm -hmm. i mean David, i think you bring an excellent point on that i mean i think um what we you know well, certainly COVID is you know um disrupted everything that we kind of do but in, yeah. in that kind of area i think mary you can remember the um i say mary who's on the frontier committee um you know, we share the guidance report. And I remember when I used to share that, I was like, this is kind of like our, I used to think is the, the best report for a school committee to see because it showed what the senior class is doing. It showed where they're getting accepted, who's going to college, two year, four year, and showing those very high percentages over the past, I think we go back almost 20 years, but we show, you can see that we even track SAT scores and, and all, this, all this information that just really shows and where the kids are getting into college. You know what I mean? Not necessarily where they're getting in and then where they're going. Because a lot of times, you know, people are, are ranking or ranking socially in the community. Oh, you know, they, most of those kids went to UMass. Well, they got into a lot of very prestigious schools, but the price tag, maybe they didn't get the financial aid offering, but they got into some of the more, um, you know, labeled schools that, you know, um, our attention and such. So, I'm thinking about, you know what I think I'll do is I, I want to share that with school committee. And then maybe if you could send me that, what you read about that, I can hear about that. It, I it was find it maybe we can do we start doing some PR stuff um, as well with that. Yeah. It's more, yeah. I'm, I guess the general broad theme is, you know, do, do we toot our own horn and, and could, should we be doing more of that, you know, around those issues? Right. And, and for folks who are hearing about, you know, um, numbers going down you know that was in regards to budget because you know finance committees were asking like you know your, your population's going down and ours is going down slightly and it's 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 projected to go down a little bit more and it has a lot to do with the size of deerfield's classes coming out so you know we're a victim to that two section class that's coming into frontier next year right so when, when deerfield whenever deerfield all of a sudden drops a full class worth the kids that drops a significant number that hits mm -hmm. frontier. So I was explaining that we'll probably see um, a reduction in some staffing for frontier, but I also, in the same sentence, said we're not going to be looking at, um, you know, uh, decimating frontier with huge budget cuts and that kind of stuff. Where it's just, I'm just saying from year to year, if we go down to 10 or 15 kids, it doesn't necessarily mean we cut two staff members. We, have, we, we, look at the, we look at the bigger picture, and if we see reduction over multiple years, which I think we're going to see next year, but it could bounce back. We have a lot of kids who are homeschooled through COVID that may come back. You're going to have a lot of transitioning from, you're going to see people, a lot of movement of people and populations. Um, I think over this summer, you're going to see a lot of you know, kids moving from district to district, um, just as people are resettled coming out of this thing. Um, so we'll see where those things land, because 15 kids can change the whole, change the whole trajectory. Um, and, and the number of kids that went to that went to private schools um, statewide. I mean, you should see that number through COVID. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so and if the inflation yeah. you know, inflation goes up, numbers come down. Kids come home from private schools. Um, so we'll see what all that all those numbers kind of shift. But I was that was the comment. I just want if anyone was listening to that one part that I made the other night regarding right. the population. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So okay. Um, we would have an, the next item would be executive session. Uh, I'd like to see if we can have a motion to enter executive session pursuant to Mass General Laws Chapter 30A, Section 21A3 to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining. We will be going into executive session and we will be not conducting. Will we be conducting business when we come out, Darius? Nope, we will not be returning to conduct business. 
Right. We will just be con- returning to adjourn. No, you so, won't be returning to adjourn. You'll adjourn out of the executive session. Oh, okay. We won't even be returning. <laughs> so, do we have a motion? So moved. A second. Who is that, Carrie? Yes. A roll call vote. Uh, Ken Cutterback, yes. Carrie Etchells? Yes. David Sharp? Yes. Mary Raymond? Yes. <laughs> and Erica Jacob? Yes. Okay, yes. we are entering. <laughs>